Okay, I'm so excited that you guys are here and you chose my workshop. Yay! <laughs> um, I so uh, my name is Amy Ford. As I said earlier, the reason why I'm passionate about pro-life and embrace grace and all that we do within churches is because I had an unplanned pregnancy. I was 19 and I grew up in the church. I loved my family and I was the oldest. Uh, four kids and I was terrified when I found out I was pregnant. Even though I grew up in a Christian school, Christian home, and knew abortion was wrong, abortion became a real option for me because of fear. Fear, you know, the enemy lies to you and tells you all the worst case scenarios and you believe it in your head. And um, and so I just thought this is what I have to do. I'll deal with the consequences of a broken heart later, but I have to get an abortion. And the father of the baby felt the same way. And so we scheduled the abortion, we paid for it, I went into the abortion room and I ended up hyperventilating and passing out in the abortion room. And the nurse was fanning me, giving me a drink of water and she said, you're too emotionally distraught to make this decision today. You can come back another day, but you're not getting an abortion. Which I have lots of friends that have had abortions and they're like, that is not a normal story. And so that's what happened. And so. I went back out in the waiting room, my baby, dad, my baby daddy was out there, and he saw my face was all swollen from crying so hard, and I was like, we're still pregnant, and he was, he said, okay, well, we'll just figure it out together, like, and we had been together for, like, two years, and we knew we wanted to get married someday, we just didn't want it to happen like this, so, but we went and told my parents, and his parents, and it wasn't as bad as what you, you know, you think you're going to be homeless, you're the black sheep of the family, everybody's going to hate you because the enemy lies to you, but it wasn't, I mean, they were disappointed for sure, but it wasn't what, you know, what you dream up in your head. And same with Ryan's family. And so because we knew we wanted to get married, we went ahead and got married while I was pregnant. So when I was 16 weeks pregnant, um, I got married and there was a man that had really like led, he was a pastor and he led Ryan to the Lord, my husband, years before. And Ryan's family had kind of gone through a divorce and a hard time, and he would pick him up and take him to youth group. Like, Ryan loved this guy. He was like his, he made him a disciple. I mean, he was amazing. And we asked him if he would marry us, and he said, no, I can't marry you because you've sinned, and so I can't bless this marriage. And so we were like, wow, we are horrible people, and we can't even get married right. And so we went and found someone else that would marry us, and but it was like a scarlet letter. It was a, on your wedding day, just shame, and that we um, we just felt like no one re no one really knows what to say. Like they don't know what to say, like congratulations or I'm sorry. So they just don't say anything. And even being at the church, like they just don't say anything. So it's like I don't know what to say to that. And so then you just feel alone in a crowd of people as you go to a church. And so we didn't really like the way it made us feel when we went to church because of course a lot of it was my own shame, you know, that I'm struggling with. And But yet if they're not talking to me, then it just, you know, makes it way worse. And so we stopped going for a while. And um, we, two years later, that pastor that wouldn't marry us, he called Ryan out of the blue and he said, I need to apologize and ask for forgiveness. He said, I feel like it was my worst mistake in pastoring history that I've ever made. And will you please forgive me? Oh, and my son, or my Ryan was like, yes, of course. He, they still talk. He's a pastor in Austin. We're in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so he still to this day, they talk almost once a week. Like they are really great friends. And so I had a son. His name's Jess. He's 21. He's at Oral Roberts University majoring in theology. He's led so many kids to the Lord. He has a passion and a fire for God that even when he was like in middle school, he, w he would fall asleep with the Bible, like laying on the bed open. Like he just is on fire for God. And um, when I, I had to tell him his story because I had a book come out and uh, when I was, he was 13. And so I was going to be on James Robinson and focus on the family and stuff. And he didn't know his side of the story. And I was terrified that he would look at that as like, we didn't want him or because I was just a dumb kid, you know, like I didn't know what God knew what I needed, but I didn't know. And so we told him, we took him to Cheesecake Factory and we told him and <laughs> I had all my friends pray, like praise, but I just don't want him to receive this as that he wasn't meant to be here or whatever. So I told him, you know, and he's a 13 year old guy so he's just I was like how does this make you feel and he's like mm. <laughs> he's a 13 year old boy yeah. Yeah. so then fast for like he he kind of processed it for a while you know 13 is a tough age I mean eighth grade it's tough everybody's trying to figure out who the heck they are 
And so he kind of did struggle for a little while of like, well, what is my purpose? And am I supposed to be here? And did my parents want me? And they didn't plan me and all of that. And so then um, the youth group, we go to a church called Gateway Church. It's Pastor Robert Morris. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him. But he, the youth group asked if he would come and share five minutes of how he's an overcomer. And so he really just thought about it and prayed about it. And he came and he asked, he came in my room, he's like, can I tell you what I'm going to share? And so he was reading it and he said, I was an overcomer before I was ever even born and that Satan had a plan to take me out, but I'm here and I'm going to use my story to change the world. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> and so, and that's what he's done. Like he really, he, he now, and it was really a word from God that he had that changed his position and his thoughts of like, no, you are here for a reason and you are going to change the world with your story. So that's what he does. He graduates in May. He's almost done. And he's getting married in July, which we're so excited. And um, so that's, that, he is amazing. He's the most handsome thing ever. Well, so <laughs> when he was 16 though, so about five years ago, the pastor that wouldn't marry us asked me to come speak at his church and it was mother's day and he wanted me to come and like share about pro love and all that and he was very open with the congregation before i had arrived of like this is what i did years ago i had a religious spirit i had a pharisee heart and this is what i did he told him everything and so then i get there i do my thing and i do a message and then afterwards he's like amy can you come back on stage and i also want your son jess to come on stage and again jess was 16 and he said amy years ago this is in front of everybody he said, years ago, I asked your husband for forgiveness, but I never really asked you, will you forgive me for what I did? You know, 16 years ago, I'm like, of course, look, look at him raise grace, like, of course. But then he looked at my son, and he said, Jess, will you forgive me for planting seeds of rejection in your heart before you were ever even born? I rejected you while you were in your mother's womb. Will you forgive me? And my son, Jess, in front of the whole church says, I forgive you. Oh, and it was such a powerful moment. Like, even just the people in the congregation, like, you could feel church wounds being lifted. Like, the fact that this, this pastor would humble himself in this way to say, I messed up. And will you forgive me? And just even, there's so many people that have church wounds, you know, and, and, and just struggle. But to see, like, that is almost even, like, a representation of, of, like, that I forgive whoever it is, you know, that hurt me in the church or whatever. It was just a very powerful moment. Mm -hmm. And so we've really just seen over time, like, the, the power that the church can play in making a difference in these women's lives. So um, we started it as a small group at, uh, at Gateway. We never in a million years thought we were going to have a nonprofit. Just let's start a group for girls with unplanned pregnancies, and we'll throw them a baby shower, and we'll see what happens. And so three girls came. One wore a coat in August in Texas because she was terrified of stepping foot in the church and for anyone to see that she was pregnant. Um, they wouldn't make eye contact. It was hopelessness. It was um, just they were they didn't feel like they even had a future. They're just in survival mode trying to get through the day. And so that first semester was kind of crazy. You know, I like to speak, but I'm not necessarily a teacher. But I'm like, you're going to be a great mom. You can do this. You know, God loves you and all that. All three of them got saved. All three, by the end of the 12 weeks, were empowered as women to be the moms that God created them to be. They made eye contact. They were excited. They were more prepared and ready to do it. They still were a little scared, but they were going to do it. And so we were like hooked. This is amazing. So we did it again. Three more girls came, 8, 14, 21, and just started growing and growing. And then other churches started calling us saying, this is really cool. Will you show us how to do it too? And God started telling us, you're supposed to help people help people. Help the church be the church and help them know how to open their doors and welcome the, these girls in. And so um, it launched, and so now we have 12-week digital curricul curriculum that you can just press, pl press play, and these girls can hear the message. And our, our heart is that we want the church to be one of the first places a girl runs to instead of the last because of shame and guilt. And that for them to just know, well, I'm in trouble, and I know I can go to the church, and I can talk to them and ask for help. And... Uh, the baby shower is such a great representation of, of um, just how it, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And, and, you know, you think about the prodigal son and how he went off and was with prostitutes and he spent all his dad's money and he had nothing left. And I love my favorite part of the scripture was um, when he turned back home and it, it said, and, and while he was a long way off, you know, the father ran to him. And you think about all these girls, like, they are still a long way off. 
but they've turned and they've turned to their heavenly father and that and just the lavishness of his love it's such a beautiful example of that and we've seen girls even go and surrender their life to Jesus the night of the baby shower because they're so overwhelmed that people would go out of their way and pick out something in their favorite color for the baby that like they want that kind of love and so it's beautiful. And then we end with something called a Princess Day. And um, it's mm-hmm. where they're crowned. And it's about their identity um, in Christ if they choose to, to accept Jesus. And if they are, it's, it's so beautiful. And we have, it's really engaging the church. Because we ask the church, do you, where are your hairdressers? Can you do hairdos for two to four? Where are your, uh, is to, can someone cook a, a cheesecake, your favorite cheesecake or whatever for the meal. You know, ever, we want to incorporate the church. Even the baby shower, it's not coming from the outreach budget of the church. It's the people. Because when the people re- see the girl in the pew, it's not a statistic anymore. It's a real girl. And they just bought her a blanket and they just heard her story and they are changed. And then their vulnerability for even being there really is even inspiring people that are post-abortive to want to share their story, to want to get involved. We're realizing we have a lot of post-abortive women that are leading Embrace Grace, not because we advertise to them or anything like that. It's just because they want to be the person that they wish they had in their life years ago when they made their abortion decision. They want to be the change. And so we're seeing that. And, you know, freedom is a journey. Free people, free people. So as you're he- as you're leading and telling these girls, like, don't get an abortion, come, we're going to walk with you. Like, you're healing, you know, continuing your healing process because you're telling them what God did for you. And Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So we overcome by sharing our story. And so it's not a prerequisite. It's just something we've noticed that we have a lot of post-abortive women that are leading. But um, we really just feel like the church needs to be a safe place. There was a pastor in Dallas. Alice one time that was telling me his daughter had an unplanned pregnancy and she had rebelled and was like gone the other direction when she found out she was pregnant she asked to come back home and he said yes and she came home baby daddy was in jail like it was a terrible situation well so she had a little girl and so she asked the way they do baby dedication so she said can I dedicate my baby at the next service and he was like yes so the way they do it is they'll have like a family and they'll say is there anyone here that represents this family and their baby we please stand and then everyone prays of the people that are involved they pray over the baby and then they go to the next family and the next family and the next family well that day then they get to his uh, daughter and her baby And he said, is there anyone here that represents this woman and her child? Will you please stand? And something amazing happened. The whole church stood up. But that's what the church is for. We don't kick each other when we're down. We pick each other up when we fall and we say, we are with you. We're in this with you and that you don't have to walk through this alone. A church without the broken is a broken church. Literally just this, actually when I was at my last meeting I got this email and I'm still just, I need to ask for forgiveness. But it's a pa- someone that's trying to lead, I don't remember what city it was, uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Someone's trying to lead and embrace grace and the pa- one of the girls got uh, pregnant and she was a member. Like he looked at it as, I'm good with the outreach. I'm good like going to get him and finding him. But like a girl got pregnant in the church and he was like, that one doesn't get the baby shower, but the oh, other one what? does because one was a believer and one wasn't. And and there were two girls in the group, so it's just like one gets one and one does. I mean, it, I cannot even comprehend. Oh oh, um, cool. And the leader's devastated because she's like, I don't understand. Like, how am I supposed to tell the girl she doesn't get a baby shower, but the other oh. one does? Like, and and then they're saying for future ones, like we're not going to call the baby shower a party. Um, we're not going to do wrapped presents because that feels celebratory. Oh. Um, don't post anything online. Uh, don't have anything in print. It has to be verbal invitations only and only for the blooms and not anybody outside because it could add heartbreak to the people that attend. And I mean, y'all, yeah. right. it's happening everywhere. Everywhere. And this, bre- this shame breeds more abortions. Like, it's one in four women and men experience an abortion. So, and the abortion rate is exactly the same inside the church as it is outside. There's no difference. So 25% of our congregations are people that have experienced an abortion. And a lot of them are suppressing and putting, like, not talking about it. And just even last night, so our team, we have, most of our team is all at the March for Life, and they have an expo, and our team is notorious for grabbing the stragglers and inviting (laughs) random people to come. And it's one lady who flew from Orange County, 
and she doesn't know why she's here. God just told her to be here. And I could tell there's something going on. There's something going on, and she came totally alone. And so we all went to Old Ebbett Grill, and she's sitting next to me, and she's just like, there's just some stuff in my past, and I just, I didn't want to come, but I felt like I was telling me to come, and I'm like, you had an abortion. And she's, <laughs> and then there's, there's a deer. <laughs> she's never told anyone, not even her husband, and she knows she needs to. Mm -hmm. And it's like been 16 years, something like that. I mean, a long time. And they're in our pews everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. One time I was speaking at a pregnancy center banquet, and at the end, this lady came up to me and she whispered in my ear. She's like, I've had an abortion, but I've been healed. And I was like, well, then why are you whispering it? She's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Don't. Like, we, w when we are vulnerable, it breeds a Me Too movement for all of these women and men that have experienced an abortion. And what we bring out to the light is what God can heal. What we keep in the darkness is what Satan will rip to shreds. And so we have to be even more vocal from, and I'm not saying we have to do like a a sermon on abortion like nobody wants to go to that church but just talking and bringing about like if you've experienced an abortion if you've gone through hard things we have an abortion healing group at our church and i would encourage all of you guys to really try to inspire an abortion healing group within your church and asking your pastor to mention it again just mention it it doesn't have to be a whole long sermon. just say god wants to heal your heart one time i was speaking at um a, uh, it was a pink impact, it was Gateway's Women's Conference, and it was at a, the Tarrant County Convention Center, which w it held 10,000 women. And there was 10,000 women there. And it was an interview, and they're like, you know, I'm always like, people that choose life are brave, and you know, these girls need to be, you know, helped, and blah, 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 blah. And so then she's like, Amy, thank you so much for being here. And I was like, wait, I want to say one more thing. And the Lord like really prompted my heart. And I said, there are 10,000 women in this arena, and that means 2,500 of you have experienced an abortion, and God wants you to you to know that he wants to heal your heart this weekend and that tell your story revelation 12 11 says and i told him the scripture and like you be bold and share your story allow god to heal your heart and you are not disqualified for ministry you are qualified because of the blood of the lamb and so that was that get off this it was probably 30 seconds that was it 30 it was not a sermon it was 30 seconds our booth afterwards were completely inundated we had two booths completely inundated with women that have had an abortion. And one specific one that really got to me, it was three women and they all had matching t-shirts so they were sisters and it was like their girls weekend because this was like a weekend conference. And it, they had made like custom shirts and they were holding up the girl in the, in the middle. She's bawling, can't even walk. And they're holding up her arms and they said, she's very overwhelmed with emotion but she wanted to talk to you. And, and she said, she just, she looked at me and said, just tears. And she just will not stop. And she said, you mean to tell me that God can use me? It was something that she could not even wrap her brain around, that God could still use her after the decision that she made. And to think that there's so many people in our congregations that feel that exact same way. And I really feel like abortion healing is the key to revival in our churches. Mm -hmm. If we can get these people free, free people, free people. Think about all these people that feel like they can't walk in the calling that God's called them to do because of what they've done, and then we activate that. Get them freedom and healing and activate that. It will change the whole culture of our churches. It will change the world. It will be amazing. There's so many great ones. Surrendering the Secret is great. Um, Forgiven and Set Free is great. There's, uh, there's several, you know, do your research. There's several ones. I think we actually are about to write one, too, that is really good. Rachel's Vineyard. Yeah, Rachel's Vineyard uh, is good. That's more, isn't that a, a, a retreat? It's a weekend long. It's a weekend long retreat, which some retreats, I will say, I feel like more freedom and healing even happens because you can't go anywhere. Like you can't skip a class. Like <laughs> you're going to be there. You're going to get the freedom and healing. But I will also say that some people are like, that's a lot. Like yeah. I don't even know if I want to show up in a classroom and like anyone to see me walk in there. You know, it just depends on the person. And then there's also even just some online stuff. Supportafterabortion.com is kind of like a bridge to, like, almost like a concierge service. So, like, you fill out the stuff, and then they will call you or email. You say if you prefer call or email. They'll call or email you, and you can say, like, do you want to be in a group? Do you want to be, would you rather watch something digital? Like, you're just not ready. I mean, anything's better than nothing. And, of course, the whole retreat, that's the ultimate. And then there's, okay, what about a group at your church? Well, actually, that's the thing. They actually only refer to pregnancy centers right now. I'm trying, we want them to do churches, but 
Still, it's it it's supportafterabortion.com. And they have a booth at the March for Life Expo. So, but they're like a bridge. So at least it's like, if they're like, I don't know what to do. Maybe I want to do digital. They would be a great, we're like, let us get you this. Because they'll follow up and check if they need anything and all that. And then maybe even if they do that, if they want to like go then into more so, of a class. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so this is talking about women inside a church. But then if there's, is there outreach mm -hmm. to bring them to the church? Mm -hmm. How is that? How yeah, is so that abortion happen? healing is probably definitely more word of mouth. But for the girls that with unplanned pregnancies, in the um, church or out? Or out. What? So that this is one thing that I feel like if I could think of the top four reasons why pastors don't want to do a program like Embrace right. Grace, it is we don't have pregnant girls in our church. I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> but say it really is all senior citizens. Like you really don't. <laughs> yeah. It's a small like church of a hundred, and you really probably don't really changing their mindset to say this is outreach like go find them it's not there are so pregnancy so like centers they will come exactly but start ne networking with your community so pregnancy centers i love tony evans does anybody know who he is yeah. oh, okay boy. tony evans he says the pregnancy centers are the first response team and the church is the hospital and that is so true and powerful so they're uh getting these girls that are wanting their free pregnancy tests or whatever they find out they're pregnant and then they're trying to, you know, see where they're at with the lie, you know, are you abortion-minded, whatever. And then it, they try to get them into an Embrace Grace support group that's in their local area. So partnering with your pregnancy centers is a great way because they refer the girls to the church and they want to. Like, because they're kind of, well, most of them are medical. There's a lot of HIPAA laws around it. And so they're a little bit more like they don't know, but they can refer them to a church so, and know. So our, our, PS, our pregnancy resource center has has spoken to some of the folks at our church. So as the the director of that pregnancy resource center could funnel people to our church for ministry, yes. for Embrace Grace. Yeah, and really it's great even advertisement for the pregnancy center. I can't tell you how many people that go to church don't know what a pregnancy center is. Like pastors even, like they don't know. They're like, isn't that Planned Parenthood? Like they don't actually know that it's like, a pro-life, you know, so it actually is helping the pregnancy center get more awareness because the girls are like, well, I wouldn't even be still pregnant if I wouldn't gone to the pregnancy center first to get my sonogram and, you know, all of that. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm one of them, a pastor mm -hmm. that doesn't know much about pregnancy mm -hmm. centers, and my first thought when you said a pregnancy center what is that? Was, was like, uh, wait, that sounds like a bad place. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just tell a little bit more yeah. about that? What, yeah. What they are? So a pregnancy center is not government funded. Most of them are not. These are independent? Uh, they're independent, donor-funded, and they are specifically there for the reason of helping women choose life. Is there some sort of, like, website, network? There's yeah. two. Yeah. CareNet and Heartbeat yeah. are the two. Yeah. Actually, we yeah. have one locally that uh, the Anglicans for Life group from um, the Falls Church has now set up a system where we have a listing. We got, you know, contact everybody as far as the pregnancy centers. So, so, so here they are. This is the area they cover. Mm -hmm. Also, here are the post board of healing, things mm -hmm. like Safe One we're doing. But also, we've started, because one of our um, focuses here is to get into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So now we have gone to the high school, and we have a girls club mm -hmm. at the high school for kid, for the girls who are pregnant. And they know it, you know, they're in school. And, but to connect with them and then pair them up with a family. Mm -hmm. So that they like can a mentor, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. you know, awesome. going where they are, yeah, kind of a thing. So if I went to, back to wherever <clears throat> my city is, mm -hmm. and I just like wrote pregnancy center in city. my web browser. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know what's so really cool center. too is a lot of them spend their money on search engine optimization. So, so, they do. They so search they do. Yeah. search engine optimization is like if you type in abortion abortion and then they use abortion as a keyword so and then like say abortion Fort Worth Texas they'll it will really come up a pregnancy center who does not refer to abortions but they bought ad dollars with that keyword abortion so that's the number one way the girls find out where their abortion clinic is is just google and they get their funding from churches and donors funded individuals Right. Yeah, there is so HIPAA. They don't follow their so they no. don't. Yeah, they're still medical though. They still have to. They have yeah. to be. You know, they can't just do crazy stuff. But they yeah. Don't receive I, Medicare I yeah. Know one of the issues uh, to parents is mm -hmm. the pregnancy centers near us, mm -hmm. and uh, they have 
started in abundant life churches. Making so that, that disciples. The church signs on, mm -hmm. you know, your, your pro-life and, you know, we have ministry with them. But then they can refer girls many times, you know, these girls in, in counseling at CareNet, you know, accept Christ. Mm -hmm. And then they can refer them to one of these abundant life churches. Mm -hmm. And then they're also, their goal is that some of their ready on arrival, and some of the other classes they do will be done in the church mm -hmm. so that the church can... Yeah, for sure. Up. And so I was just actually with Roland just right before I came oh, over okay. here. And we... we so we kind of work a little bit different, but yet we complement each other. Right. So Making Life Disciples is a really great program that you guys can look up. Basically, they do great training and equipping for churches mm -hmm. on... If you have a girl that's pregnant, where do you take her? What's a pregnancy center? Like, this is where, this is what you should say, this is what you shouldn't say. You know, all of that training, just so we know and are ready at a moment's notice if there's a girl, you know, that's pregnant. Um, Embrace Grace is different is because we actually have curriculum for the girls. So it's a, a program that the girls go through, but specifically within the church. We want them to get used to going to church. We want them to raise their kids in the church. We want their families to come to church. But they are terrified of stepping foot into a church because they think we're going to judge them, shame them, tell them what a, how they're, they've messed up their lives. I mean, I can't tell you how many stories of like, I thought you were going to, you know, tell me I was going to hell or tell me I was, like, they, and we're very specific even with our first class that it's only the leaders who are sharing our stories. That's it. We don't ask them anything about them. They think we're going to have a Bible lesson, but they're coming for the free stuff of the baby shower when they hear all the leader stories and they're like, okay, that lady's story is way worse than mine. And if God did that for her, then maybe God will do that for me too. And if she could say that, then maybe I can say what I'm struggling with. And it's like their walls start coming down and then they start opening up and realizing we actually are a safe place and we are actually are for them. They have to know that before we can even go into the gospel. They got to know we trust them and that, uh, or that they trust us and that we love them. And so then we start with the, with the all, it's freedom, healing, it is truth over lies, like they're, all the doubts and stuff that they struggle with and the enemy's lies. It is, it's identity. If they can understand their value and their worth, which 100% of them, I would say, is that this is what they struggle with. If they can know their value and their worth fully, not just in their head, but in their heart, that's when all the things they shouldn't be doing becomes things they don't want to do anymore. Because they fall in love with Jesus and he totally changes what they want what they want to they don't want to do that stuff anymore because he transforms them and so we just go through freedom healing talking about how much he loves them we talk about sin we talk about repentance we talk about his love we talk about his word and how it's a it's not a book of law it's a book of love because he loves us and just like i wouldn't go tell my kid to, to go you know cross the street and like we say things to protect and that god wants love protects and just going through and try to change your mindset about who they think god is because a lot of them either think they're, that God is like their earthly father. So if their earthly father was not around, then they think God actually isn't around and hears them. Or if they think that, that their earthly father was abusive or, I mean, these girls have so many stuff they've gone through, then God is that way. And so really trying to change your mindset of who a heavenly father is. So it's just press play, which makes it super easy to lead a group. And, and we have um, a back-end portal with all of the handouts, the digital downloads, every handout that goes with every single lesson, training videos that go with each lesson, like, hey, you might realize that their walls are starting to come down this week, and they're starting to open up more, and this is how you can respond. Just really walking alongside you, plus our national team is always available to help along the way. And so we have about 725 churches in 47 states and 10 countries. <coughs> And we equip all these churches to do Embrace Grace, and we train the leaders about how to go into the pregnancy centers, network with them, and invite the girls into the church because we really want them to get in the habit of going to church. They might come for the free stuff, but Jesus totally changes their life, and it's amazing. And another thing that we have that's really cool in your little uh, handout, and it's kind of another one other incentive to get these girls to come to the group. So there's... Uh, or maybe inspiration to come to the group. So the, we, any pregnancy centers that have a church within 20 miles that has an Embrace Grace group within 20 miles of their pregnancy center, we give them free love boxes. So these boxes, they give to women that are single and pregnant and just found out they're pregnant and maybe freaking out. And the boxes are to inspire a live decision, plus they have an invitation to whatever local church that is doing Embrace Grace, and we pay for all of that. 
Well, we have, I mean, don donors are free to, happy to So we could go data. online and find out if there's any other churches in our area that are involved and maybe yeah. check with them and see. Embracegrace.com, and then there's a big group directory. So you put in your zip code and all of the groups within, uh, I mean, it'll go however mile, mile radius, and you can see what churches have in your area. It has that leader's information, their phone number, their email address, so girls can immediately connect with them. And so these love boxes are really cool, too, because your church can actually even host a Share the Love event, which is where you get all, like, if you, as a church, you get all the unassembled boxes. And we ship them all to you, and you have a big outreach night. And you have all your members come, and you all put together love boxes. we got a whole, we got all the videos to show you how to do it. And one thing that I love is it has a Dear Brave Girl letter. There's handwritten letters in every single box. And... Um, you would need someone to kind of look at them and make sure that they're okay. So you should see our discard pile. It's like, no, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> burn those, right? Yeah. No, we actually keep them for entertainment, but um, just internal staff stuff. But anyways, they get to write. Uh, and they get to speak life into someone that just found out they're pregnant. How amazing! There's one, a little girl that I saved it because I love it. And it's all this chicken scratch handwriting, and it says, I bet your baby will be the best thing that ever happened in the world. Aww. And the girl that wrote it is an Embrace Grace baby, and so I'm Aww. like, this is precious. <laughs> but it's got the onesie that says best gift ever. It's got, um, so I have a book, A Bump in Life, and it's just, it's not preachy. It's 20 testimonies of girls that chose life. Girls by date rape, preacher kids, girls that are on drugs, girls that were in jail when they figured out they're pregnant. It's every story you could ever imagine. They're all real stories. Mm -hmm. But how, as they chose life, or girls that placed their baby for adoption, it's all women that chose life and how God, like, totally took care of them in the process. Mm -hmm. Forgive me if you've already covered this, yeah. but, like, so the typical way that a pregnant girl would find out about you is? A lot of them is through pregnancy centers, okay. for sure. The second one is really a lot of word, word of mouth. Okay. Um, and, and also, what we found is if we can get one group going in one semester, that girl that was pregnant in high school and went through Embrace Grace, she goes back to high school, and then another girl gets pregnant, and she goes to that girl. Okay. And she's like, I'm pregnant, I'm freaking out, I don't know what to do. She is who's referring the girl. So, like, the more mm -hmm. ones you do, it's almost like a multiplication effect. Mm -hmm. Like, Gateway, the original one, we've now done it for 22 semesters, and we have, like, 80 girls. Mm -hmm. Like, it's insane. And... We um, per year, and then we have um, wow. we have like other ones that are maybe one or two, you know, because they're just getting started and it just. But even the more you get in the community, the more you share. Because I really will say that the the smaller ones I think are more impactful because you have more time to dedicate to whatever their needs are and like you know coaching them through. So. Um, and then they get the book, they get a journal about being brave, they get the dear brave girl letter, and then one other thing that's really cool is that pregnancy centers can't usually give churches the girls' names because of HIPAA and privacy laws. So they can only just say, you know, there's a church up the street that wants to love on you, there's an embrace grace group, go, and we pray and hope that they do. Well, we made one loophole. So we've got a postcard in here that says, when they get this box, it's like, hey, we want to send you a necklace. It's super cute. You're going to love it. It's totally free. Go to this website. Or actually, it's a text. It's like text 5543, brave girl, blah, blah, blah. And then it sends them a landing from here, where's your address so we can send your necklace? And then we send it. Well, now what happened is we got their info. And we the church gets to love without HIPAA. So now we're texting. <laughs> and we're like, are you wow. okay? Really? Yeah, are you do loopholes. Yeah, really. <laughs> are you doing okay? Like, how can we help you? How can we pray for you? Did you know there's a leader up the street at this church up the street? You know, we're looking at our national database. Like, there's one. They want to have coffee with you. Can we connect you? And trying to help be another reinforcement of the, uh, inspiring the girl to choose life. And then connecting her to a church that wants to be a point person to help sit with her and talk to her and then get her plugged into the church for groups. Mm -hmm. When you're helping these girls, do you ever get pushed back from the parents? The parents don't want it. They don't want it. Um, well, if, it, if they're less than 18, you know, technically they're in, still in their parents' uh, jurisdiction. So it's if they don't want uh, their girl to go through it, then that's their parents' decision. But if they're over 18, like, the parent doesn't really get a say in that. Like, yeah. But if the girl's like, uh, it was hard, we don't really advertise or broadcast. What if they're kicked out of the home? Do you have? 
Uh, people that would take. Oh yeah. Well, we so we're the national. So we have we have outsourced to everywhere. There are maternity. I mean, in my Dallas Fort Worth area, there's tons. Well, not tons. I'd say there's probably ten maternity homes. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also just shepherding homes within churches. I mean, we. This is what I love about the church. It's like, do you need a car? <laughs> well. Fred over there just said he had a car that he didn't want anymore. And then, oh, you need your tires flat? Well, this guy over here has got a jack in his car. I mean, it's church, right? Yeah. So once they get involved, it's community. We're a family. And yes, it's a messy family, but we are a family. So getting them in, into the church helps. Like, everybody has something to give. Are you great at budgeting? Are you great at resume writing? Are you great at nurturing and, and helping walk alongside? Are you good at dating? watching their kid while they go, you know, we all have something. And so as the church, really empowering each of their members of like, not just pro birth, like, like it's not just focused on the pregnancy, but like pro whole life, because that's a lot of the reasons why the girls are getting abortions. They just don't see how they can afford or they can't do this. But like, it's, it's a shame that someone would feel like they have to get an abortion because they don't think they have a babysitter or whatever, you know, like if we can just trust the church and, to know that we're in this together and all being Holy Spirit led as the Lord speaks to us to serve or give in a certain way to make it so that abortion is completely unnecessary because we are all here to help each other when, you know, it's hard. And and so, anyways, these boxes, they're for free to the pregnancy centers and then they give them to the girls and it has the invitation to the local group and then that gets them connected to a family. And we're just seeing so many transformations and like lives changed, saved, both physically and eternally, and it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I was going to point out the same law that mm -hmm. allows them to go and have abortions without telling their parents, which they're pregnant, they're considered emancipated, and their families cannot have any kind of say over what they do. I know. And you know what's crazy is my kid's school still calls to give them, ask if they can have Tylenol, and it's like, right. yeah, but yet you know, yeah. abortion. So you should, so in other words, in some sense, they, the family can't tell them not to. Yeah, true. Yeah, because I guess if they are officially men's Same thing. Mm -hmm. Amy, I, I wonder if you see this in other parts of the country. In Houston, as you probably know, we have both the largest Planned Parenthood office in the country. Really? 12 um, wow. stories high. What? Um, and we also, by God's grace, have some of the largest uh, uh, pregnancy assistance centers in, in Houston as well. Yeah. But this topic of basically the church being the church, mm -hmm. to, to especially, has been something that the pastors across denominations are beginning to uh, get rally it. around. Mm -hmm. uh, because many of us in Houston realize that um, if we're not addressing the key cultural issues, this, Pornography. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many homosexuality. Mm -hmm. but, but if we're not addressing it together, cross obviously Christ honoring churches. Yeah. Uh, but cross denominations. So that's another thing for church leaders in the room. If if uh, this is a this particular kind of ministry is a great thing to get others in your region mm -hmm. involved in, especially like smaller churches. Mm -hmm. um, um, they may not smaller and older. Mm -hmm. They may need the synergy of two or three other churches to be to be with them, to be part of it, to really feel, to catch the. Yeah, we've the seen vision. them how they connect together, and and also what's really cool is we have like a private leaders page, so people all over the nation, and so we'll say so it's twelve weeks, so sometimes a church might start in January on their group, and then the church down the street might be starting in March. So when the pregnancy centers are like sending these girls, it might we've seen like well a leader will post on the page. We just started our group and we're already in class four and they kind of missed like a lot of the meat. Like, is there another one that's really close? Can I send this girl to you? And it's like we're passing these girls around oh, to make cool. sure that they're being, yeah. they're not like falling through the cracks. They're not, ha cracks. They're not having to go too long without getting into a support system and everyone working together. It's really beautiful. It's totally amazing. Okay. So uh, is there a similar group for boys? In other words... Yes. They need to start early, really training up girls and guys mm -hmm. about what they're getting. And the reason I say this is this: too much in the medical institution as well as in the culture. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about the culture, but it's in uh, being pushed by medical institutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking back 26 years ago. My 12-year-old son went for a sports physical mm -hmm. and was handed a folder that had a condom in it. 
how to use the condom, but also how to have safe homosexual sex. That was oh, that oh, long ago? Oh, that oh, long ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, I raised Cain when I found <laughs> out that's what they gave him. Um, but that wow. is happening, and if I hadn't been present and my son hadn't been one that would not have hidden it from me, mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing that the kids it's are getting, getting at the schools sometimes, Ugh. at uh, places that they're going for medical care and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I had heard, um, I read one story of a counselor who really struggled at college. They were not allowed to counsel girls that came to them to have the alternative like care net or some of the other things the, the or experience. talk about the spiritual issue or the morality issue even if the uh, individual brought it up <laughs> they were not allowed to go there wow. they had to guide them towards Planned Parenthood that oh. was their option mm. and if they went against that then they could lose the job yeah so um, there's an awful lot of a push towards this mm -hmm. And so we need to do something to counter that and really come come strongly against it as parents. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, we are we're launching dads this spring, Embrace Legacy, and we're really excited about that. We're seeing some dads show up, and they like want to come in the class, but the. The girls a lot, some of them will have a lot of guy wounds or whatever, so we're like, can you, but, but what's cool is that a leader's husband, they'll call me like, can you come up here, there's guys showed up. Like, go have coffee with them or whatever, and so they're getting, but we're now <laughs> going to give them some, some tools. Now, going back before the, the a pregnancy ever happens, um, one that I know, I'm in kind of some big picture, dreamy, making big plans groups with some key pro-life leaders, that's where I've been the last two days, um, mm. and the FEM, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, it's F-E-M-M, -M. Uh, they are, they actually are very science-based, but the people that started it are all believers, and so they have like fertility and health awareness apps and things where it tracks your cycles and, and all of that, but they also are launching uh, to combat the Planned Parenthood, because a lot of the curriculums that are especially California and all of that, that they actually are Planned Parenthood curriculum, it's just in a different name. You mean in the schools? In the schools, in the schools. yes. And so they're in the process of trying to rewrite um, the sex education that is in more of a whole and wellness and uh, it's not going to they're going to they're trying to do it in the catholic stores as a as a beginning but um i don't think it's not god so it's like if we can it's something though that's healthy and whole and science proven that this is actually the better way if it's going to go in a public school like this is the better way to teach so they're they i think they're getting a lot of funding and it's like a big push to like really try to combat you know it's hard like in the south like in texas there are a lot of our schools and I can go bring them love boxes and they'll give them to the girls because it's referring the girls to a pregnancy center. They usually, at least the South, can do the pregnancy centers. They can't refer to a church. So they can give them the love boxes and tell them, go to this, go to this pregnancy center and they're going to take care of you, go get a sonogram, you need to go get checked out by a medical professional. But a lot of them, though, I would think probably North or California, they would never even be able to do the love boxes. It's too, I mean, there's God in it. And, all that so I know it's gonna take everybody and I but just know that there are some there are wheels turning to combat what's coming and just be so praying so like just be praying because it's a lot there's a lot of spiritual warfare there's like it's it's just a lot going on but no one is staying stagnant like there are actions that are being made that are going to change the world. And so we need to know the this too point. I mean I've never heard of this until well you said, the thing so is it's like is if the pro-choice people got wind of it. Got wind. Uh, it's like uh, you don't yes. want them. You want right. them to be under the radar somewhat, so, so that they can so get the work done. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll flip it out of this thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that's the hard thing. It's like, but so we just have to trust and pray and you know all that. Uh -huh. Sorry, you just kind of hopped over this. Mm -hmm. um, you're doing what for young men? Because oh, we're that's, 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 <laughs> that's your that's me, passion. Right? So, uh, when I was in Colorado, I worked for the state's maximum security facility for juvenile offenders. Wow. Well, which uh, is a state place, but I'm still pouring into young men. Um, in the neighborhoods I live in, fatherlessness is, I mean, I was out in the basketball it's court the other day, and 10 young men 
99% of them either don't know a dad, dad's in prison, whatever. So my whole thing is, if young men also know their worth and their value, they will stop trying to find it in a girl. For right? sure. Yeah. So, I love that. right? It's so, the key yeah. issue on both sides. It's, right. That's yeah. the struggle. Right. Is that it's kind of creepy if, a, if, a, if an old guy's talking to young girls, right? That's just the. Really <laughs> <important. laughs> but I, it know, depends. I, I if you're, I, there's some guys that'll say, "I'm proud of you." Like an older man. I don't know. There's something super sweet about, like even a pastor. You know, I'm proud no, of no, you. No, no, no. I, I, I get that. And I have a daughter. And, and, <laughs> yeah. I, so you said that, and then kind of hopped over, and I was like, "No way." That's the other yeah. You, doing so it launches in the spring. Okay. It's called okay. Embrace Legacy, and the guy that wrote it, he's on our board. He's amazing. He was raised by a single mom. He came home one day in high school, and there was a note on the door that said, "I shot myself. Uh, don't open the door. Go to the neighbor and call the police." And oh. went to the neighbor. She had. She was dead. And he just said, if she would have had a support system like Embrace Grace, then um, she wouldn't have done what she did and so he's extremely passionate about just wanting to make sure that people have the support systems that they so desperately need and so he's writing it and it's all about identity like you're saying and it's to combat the father's fatherlessness because a lot of these guys they never had a father themselves so they don't even know what that looks like and they feel like they've lost it before they even start because they don't know and so they don't want to like fail at something because they don't know what healthy looks like so really trying to walk alongside them and empower them as men to um, doesn't necessarily mean get back with baby dad or baby mama or whatever like if that didn't work out but at least be a dad that's where we're going to change the world too we can have more we need more dads in the world for sure and so we're working on that. It launches this spring and being able to help all of these leaders because we're just keep hearing more and more of the leaders like, the guy showed up, you know, what do I do? And it's such a great opportunity. They showed up, like, come on. Because a lot of them are like, they changed the phone number, they're, you know, they just are gone. So, um, so we're really excited about that and a lot of testimonials and not, I mean, it's going to be full of God, but we just need real stories of real people, just like what you're saying of working in the jails. I mean, we can't make it like, oh, you know, this happened and I stole a reinforcement from a from a uh, the the grocery store. Without, you know, a little reinforcement. It has to be like they are they are going through hard stuff. So to really talk about where people have been, but then where what God did. I mean, you know, it's the stories are what. They go. They remember, you know, more than even the teaching. So that is in the works as well. So we're just really excited about the church's role and what the church can do to really make a difference in the life. I love how you said it. To teach the church to be the church. That's a concept yeah. that yes. yeah. could catch so on, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're on this one. <laughs> the resource centers typically come on board with this pretty readily because yes. I'm involved with one in our area and I'm, I'm sitting here imagining in my head what it would be like if I went to them and said, is this something that this. you all would be interested in tying in with the local church with? And wondering what they would, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just imagine. I don't well, know a lot of them love the free bo love boxes. So we're like, hey, <laughs> you get a church going and then we're going to send you the love box. So they're all about that. And they also just want to know that they're taken care of. Like, I think the pregnancy centers get so, like, the church has really relied too much on the pregnancy centers to do it all, to be the church, to do, and it's hard. Like, they, and the pregnancy centers are only for the first year or two, and then that's it. So if we can get them into the church, the only time I ever get weird thoughts it seems like it's from smaller towns of pregnancy centers that really, like maybe they saw 13 in a year, like really small towns. Yeah. And I think it's almost like they feel like it's competition. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, the church, it's not competition. It's right, the right, church. Exactly. Like, yeah. you can still do your do the practical or whatever. You can do a spiritual too. Like, But send them to the church. they got to get in the habit. Let their kids be raised in the church. We, I know we have a table with all the brochures about various churches so that clients could take. Yeah, so they so, already have so they that. already have some tie yeah, in but not a it. program to tie this into. Yeah, here's right. the thing though. Like I've seen I was talking to a pastor the other day and he was just like, we don't need something like this. They all, people know that they're all everyone's welcome at our church. They're <laughs> drunk, <laughs> they're this. That's a little and it's like, thing. okay, but like they don't know that. 
Like, they don't know. And plus, it's like a giant mega church, and they just got to come and sit on the back row and then leave and no one yeah. say anything. Like, they got to have a point person, whether it's making life disciples, which they train to have a point person, or having a specific group. That's when they're going to get in the habit of going. Like, you can't just say, well, it's welcome. You got to have that bridge. They're not going to come on a Sunday morning for this. Right. They well, will, we do I mean, have some that are on Sunday mornings, well, but they, most of them are always Sunday mornings. But they'll start coming after right. on Sunday mornings, mm-hmm. after they've had... But our leaders, leaders have been trained to, like, they're oh, like, I'm sitting on the third row. I'm yeah. coming to get exactly. you. Yeah. We're going yes. this weekend. Yes. I know, yes. we'll take you to lunch afterwards. Yes. I mean, they yes. are trained. That is what they're... By the end of the 12 weeks, they're not on their own. they are, like, like totally going. Totally. Yeah. Also, it's like, you know, you can say, yeah, oh, yeah, everybody's welcome at our church, but, like, you need to have something, like... There needs to be something just a, that is a material yeah, invitation. Tangible. Mm-hmm. You know, when we think about the people that come to visit our churches, we have gift bags. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like it little helps. things. We're like our with, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, it's like with our church, like we put little things that were made locally that are just like really like well, hard felt nice. Mm-hmm. Well, we used to just you give know? the pregnancy centers flyers, and then the, they would tell, give them a grocery flyer, go to this church. But they're in like trauma mode. They're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I'm gonna make it through the day. And this ends up in the floorboard of their car, and they got a whole bunch of other brochures, and like it's they didn't even read it. But, but yeah. the love box, you can't That's throw that yeah. away. Yeah. That is too cute. I'm just the, yeah, box. but just like to complete my thought. It's just like you know, if I'm in that, I can think back at a time when I'm just feeling just worthless and just terrible. Because I've made a lot Actually, of really bad decisions. You're amazing. <laughs> uh, but you still, know, you know, it's like you, whether it's you know yeah, an appropriate sure feeling or not, like you just feel utterly just terrible and worthless. And then somebody gives you a gift, mm-hmm. just that <laughs> feeling of like, yeah, oh. for me. I, know. <laughs> I remember one girl said, um, I felt like <laughs> there was one person in the world that was actually happy for me. That was one mm-hmm. one girl that got the box. Okay, Sandy. Um, I was just curious, now that we know about this wonderful program, what would be the first step in getting it started at your church? Like, you're talking about training leaders. Obviously, you can't just start an embrace grace yeah. group without being training. taught to be a leader. So all of our training is totally digital. We don't like have to fly out and train you, so it's totally digital. And one thing that we do require, our stuff is not transactional. So you can't, like, go to Amazon and buy our curriculum because... People call us and be like, hey, I live in New York, and I want to do Embrace Grace. Okay, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't really go to church. I'm just going to do it at my house or at Starbucks or something. Like, we don't know if you're a total weirdo. Like, we don't have <laughs> the people in the – we don't have background checks. Like, we don't have that. So a pastor, whoever is groups, pastor, oversight, outreach pastor, women's pastor, however the, di- the structure of the church is, the pastor oversight has to sign an agreement form. It's very simple, but at least in, we know we're on the same page. I'll never tell a girl to get an abortion. Yeah. I'll never judge or shame her publicly or privately. Mm-hmm. I will be the spiritual covering and authority of this group. I approve this leader to lead this group, and she is healthy, emotionally, physically, like, to do this. And this is going to be our group, because that group operates yeah. under the covering of that church. Wow. So, like, whatever. At my church, you have to be a member, a tithing member, uh, t- talk to a leadership pastor, and then you can lead a group if they approve you. So, like, whatever that church's system is, that they do it through that. Then they sign it, and then we're like, here, here's all the, you get the uh, user and password, you get access to all of the training videos, and it's super easy, even with the handouts that literally go with each lesson, it's plug and play, and print, it's all there, super easy to use. And so, the first thing is, actually, if you, we, uh, Lauren, my assistant's here, and she's got, if anybody's interested in getting more information, whether it's for you specifically to lead, or if it's something that you feel like your pastor needs to know about it as a great resource, or if you know even someone, one of your friends is like, she's been saying she wants to do something and she's trying to figure out what it is. I'm going to send it to her. If y'all want any information, she's got little cards you can fill out and then we can get you the PDF starter guide, which basically is just the digital version of this starter guide inside here, which just helps because like it's harder to track down a pastor to give it to them when you could just it'll be emailed to you and that way you can forward it to whatever. So if anyone wants that, she's passing that around and pens and stuff. But um, that would be the first thing to start. And then once your pastor approves it, then we give you the tools and then you can start networking with your pregnancy centers and and um, and plus if you even could look to see if there's any in your area, if you wanted to pick the brain of a local leader, you can go to our website, find the directory. All our leaders are so great and they love to help get other ones going. 
So, um, not in our church, but like well, in the different church oh, really? around. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? No, but I'm saying like, there's yeah. a, I can always find out. Mm -hmm. I just have a comment. I am so delighted to see focusing on the church yeah. and how the church needs to embrace us. Yeah. As an Anglican priest, I shied away from the Lord's call because of my own abortion, mm -hmm. which I believed all the lies and all the mm -hmm. junk. By God's grace, I'm seeing Anglican bishops here. I've been coming to this march for 15 years, and it, it's only been since the summit that we have a true, strong presence mm -hmm. of Anglican leadership, and I am so touched mm -hmm. by that. And, and to see, because this so much of what you hear, even in our churches, unfortunately, is that we're not going to talk about political issues. Yeah. We're not gonna, it's not about no. political issues. Slavery wasn't sin political. Issue. It's a sin issue. And call it what it is, but love the person. Right. And there's been so much, um, and I, I'm sorry, I hope not to offend any clergy here, because I'm clergy too, but you know, our churches were designed initially to be kind of this network of like everybody comes to us and everybody has to look mm -hmm. like us and everybody has to act like us and preach like us and, and when you kind of hung out on the outside of that you really felt it I mean I was born and raised as a Roman Catholic and the Catholics had such a good handle on this then I became an Anglican priest and God bless <laughs> Archbishop Duncan who I was um, ordained under and Bishop Hobby and the Pittsburgh and Bishop Guernsey and all of you who are right here because this has not always been how this pro-life stuff has been represented. Mm -hmm. It's been represented as a political movement, not as a sanctity of life issue. Mm -hmm. And I just commend you, mm -hmm. and I'm so thrilled to have this workshop and to have all of you who are wearing collars or not wearing collars and are <laughs> pastors and churches to be here because it's up to us. Yeah, to uh, totally. We can make it unnecessary. Whether it's whether it's healing from an abortion or reaching out to that 15-year-old girl who doesn't speak English, mm -hmm. who is pregnant and needs help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you so That's much. so good. So sure. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wondered, I mean, a long time ago, I wondered if there was some sort of thing out there, like I, I, the concept of like, Billboard, like 1 800 options, you know, or something like that. And it, it, it said, you know, it's a choice. And, uh, and then, like, it was a church group that said, look, if you're pregnant, like, and you live in Minnesota, we'll fly you to Florida and live with a family for nine months and we'll adopt your baby. Mm -hmm. Something like that exists. Well, I know there's Option Line, and that is a 1-800 number plus a website called OptionLine.com, but they refer to pregnancy centers. Okay. They don't refer to churches, and then they rely on the pregnancy centers to refer to the churches. Um, but really, we've seen that organically in grassroots through word of mouth and, and things like that. So, But I don't think that they're, you know, this is what I feel like. Whenever someone has a great idea like that and there doesn't exist, Maybe you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. That was 92. That was a long time ago. Anyway, hey, so. we're from Chapel Hill. We yeah. yeah. All right. We're right. just like 20 minutes down the road. <laughs> Okay, well, she just gave me uh, the warning that we're just about done. So, would it, you let us pray for you? Yeah, that would yeah, be amazing. Love I would love that. Love that. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful and we love and adore you. And we are thankful for Amy and this organization, Lord, and we ask you to bless it in every way. We ask you to expand it in every way, Lord. We, uh, we are thankful that it, it represents your kingdom everywhere it goes. And in every church it is fostered in. And so, Lord, um, we ask you to encourage her even this day uh, as to what, what, what you desire to do. Uh, and what you desire to do even greater in the days to come. Uh, bless her in every way, and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. And you guys know, y'all are all influencers. So 
Think about even who you know that maybe would be passionate about leading it, other churches that should do it. Just spread the word about this because if there's 300, over 300,000 churches in America and everyone should be a, a safe place for these girls to go to. So that is our vision statement so we can help that happen, whether it's Embrace Grace, Making Life Disciples, whatever. Just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your prayer. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So appreciate it. We need it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I love what you said. So, so good.